What's going on everybody? Give me a mic check real quick before we go live. And we're live. <laughs> Didn't give you much chance to give me a mic check, but we're here. We're kicking. It is Wednesday night. Here at PBH in West Palm Beach, Florida, welcome everybody to PBH Live. We're now episode number 39, and we are going to be continuing some of our discussion from last week, which, if you missed it, was related to the Coyote swaps in your 05 to 09-10 S197 Mustangs. So tonight we're going to continue that discussion and talk a little bit about gauges and what we know about them right now, what we're working through as far as making everything work. Um, and we'll share that with you. So you have it and you can share this information as it's no secret. We just want to make sure everybody knows as much as possible going forward on it. I'll start with my regular introductions. If you are new to the show or maybe if you're just coming back as a regular fan or, or viewer, thank you very much. My name is Frank Perdomo. I work here at Power by the Hour Performance. PBH Performance is a specialist in coyote swaps. We also do 6R80 rebuilds and some of the 10R80 stuff as well. We're going to be dabbling into the Godzilla swaps as well as parts become available for that. And we are specialists in pretty much all those arenas and kind of have a pulse of what's going on in the aftermarket. So we do a lot of tech calls, a lot of emails in this show. Just try to get as much tech and product knowledge out there to our viewers, to our customers, or potential customers, even builders and shops, to try to help them basically gear their swaps around the known right now, what's available right now, knowledge of these powertrains. So you don't have to be a customer, you don't even have to be a fan, but if there's some technical information we share with you here tonight and some product knowledge, you're more than welcome to enjoy it and use it to your best uh, ability. PBH is located in West Palm Beach, Florida. We're right at the end of the airstrip at Palm Beach International Airport. Our phone number is 561-737-2331. Our email address is info at pbhperformance.com. My direct email is frank at pbhperformance.com, and our website is pbhperformance.com, where you can find all of our products, blog posts, new products, customer builds, and of course you have our YouTube channel, Facebook, and Instagram. We are on all three. We're most active on YouTube. We're trying to get some more social media content out on the other channels, but YouTube is pretty much where we're putting most of our information these days. Every Wednesday night, we're here from 7 to 8 o'clock at night, Eastern Time. And you're more than welcome to join us. The chat room is live. We're going to say hello to some of the people in there right now. And we also have a super chat. Now, the super chat are paid questions. You don't have to ask your questions through that channel. But it does ensure that we don't miss them and we address them here on the show and as a group as well. So feel free to post up. You can make a donation, I think, as low as 2 or $3 or whatnot. And all that money goes back into what we do here on the channel and to get us out to some events, which we're going to be talking about a little bit here later on in the show. So, 
Let's say hi to some people, man. What is going on? We got uh, the first person to post an ad was Frank Weaver. Frank Weaver is the, that's a new name at the top of that list. So welcome, Frank. You have now made it into the first post club, which nets you absolutely nothing other than my admiration. Uh, Lorenzo Enzo. How you doing, man? Damn. <laughs> I think you're posting that because he got beat by Frank Weaver. Uh, Renner5959, what's going on, brother? Uh, 2000 MCR, Jamie's Garage, how we doing? Uh, Jordan Dunning, how we doing, brother? Good to see you. Andrew Hanlon, Wild Horse 5 Nathaniel Sanchez, how we doing, brother? Let's see here. Michael Knotts, Inzane Mustang, Donald Fuller, David Venus, how we doing? Thank you for joining us tonight, guys. Uh, Frank Weaver chimes in again. And then we have F-150 S-550, who's a regular here on the show, a regular contributor. Thank you very much. And he he just has a question right off the bat. What's up, Frank? How does the trans thermostat valve work? Now, we did cover that in a 6R80 video we did earlier on uh, on the on the live broadcast. But basically, it's a mechanical thermostat just like you have one in the cooling system. And once your, th once your transmission gets up to temperature, it opens up and allows flow to go out to your cooler. So it's very similar to your engine mount a thermostat. Um, and if your transmission does not have one, you should put one in. Some of the F-150 transmissions had an external thermostat housing. So if you're seeing that you have flow right off the bat, then that means that your transmission potentially had that external thermostat housing controller from the factory. And now you put it in your Coyote swap, you have zero thermostat on your cooler, on your transmission fluid, so it takes a while for it to get up to temperature. So you should put a thermostat in there, which we do sell them. They're on our website. I think they're only like 20 bucks. Thermostat, you got to drop the pan, get access to it, that kind of stuff. But we did cover it in our 6R80 video. I want to say it was specifically about transmission cooling. It's probably going to be in the 20s as far as episodes go. I'll find a link to it and put it in the description of this video at the end of this so that you can find it and go ahead and watch it based on this question you asked here tonight. So... Uh, we'll get rolling here in a second. Kevin Biasocia. I don't I don't know how to be a Biasocia. I don't know how to say that, uh, but thank you for joining us. 2000 NCR. Uh, who was first? Uh, Frank Weaver was first, bro. Where were you at? Uh, Ryan Merrill. Uh, how we doing, man? Everything is well. Everyone's doing well. Everyone's healthy in my circle. Things are busy. We are buku busy right now and i am in the middle of a bunch of projects new products that we're trying to get going we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight uh we seem to have new product updates every week and we have some more tech as far as the main uh topic of the show with the three valve s550 or excuse me three valve the coyote swaps and some events we're going to go to which ties into the wrap I still don't have a full rendering of the wrap. I will show you guys the same thing we showed you last time with the same opportunity. I'm not locking that program in 100% yet until I have the full rendering so people know what they're getting themselves into. I think it's going to be pretty cool. Chuck at CRD Wraps has really helped me out. And if you don't know about what we're talking about right now is my personal 1991 Mustang that we autocross on a regular basis and cover here is one of the topics on the show. We're going to be taking it on the road this year. We got invited to one of the premier events for autocross. It is Coyote Swap, TKO 600, Maxim Motorsport Suspension, the works, wide body, you know, Ford Star wheels, and we're doing a cambered full floater rear end in it and whatever we can throw at it before we get on these events. We're going to be taking to some of the good guys events, the Holly Ford Fest and the King of the Mountain event. We're going to wrap it and we're going to come up with a theme and you're going to have the opportunity to be a viewer sponsor on the theme. What does that mean for you? A, your name that you have on YouTube will be on the car along with the chosen picture of your avatar or if you want to change it to your face or a company logo, something along those lines. And I think for the most part for 250 bucks, you get to be a part of the wrap, be on the vehicle for the season. And it's pretty cool. I'll show you a quick picture of it now before we get into the topic and so forth. Where's my deck lid wrapped up? Here it is. That is what the deck lid kind of is probably going to lay out as. You obviously, you can put your username, a long username, a longer username, even longer username, or Steve Sheckenberg. He's already on the program. He gave like a G already. 
Uh, but yeah, PBH Live logo, YouTube logo. Thank you, viewer sponsors, and you will be with me every step of the way as far as coverage here on the YouTube channel through our social media network, as far as Facebook and Instagram as well, blog post, and you're going to be on the car, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't know a whole lot of people who do that, and I thought it was really nice to potentially give you guys a chance to be part of it as well. If you don't want to be part of it, that's cool. You can still support the project, which we're going to talk about a little bit here real quick as far as updates because I have some cool stuff going on there. Now, tonight I'm wearing a MAF, where's it at? Where we go? MAF Racing and Performance Tool shirt. That's these guys right here. That's Tim Flanders. Tim Flanders is known for one of his Coyote swaps that he did was a white 4i single turbo. Really, really nice car. It's on the back of this shirt in particular right here. He specializes in some products for Fox bodies, and most of you guys, the you probably may already have his products on your vehicle to have stuff for suspension, but mainly what they're known for are their radiator supports and their bumper supports, and I opted to go ahead and get it for my car. Now, the reason I'm doing this is that fiberglass shit on the front of a Fox body is so annoying, and I every time I take my bumper off, I end up with itchy arms, and I wanted to get rid of it. So I w went ahead and ordered all the parts from Tim to do so. Now, I didn't realize how much weight savings there is, so I'm going to show you what that is right now. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Here we go. Math Racing, here we go. Ooh, let's see what picture it leaves me on. Okay, so here we go. That's the stock front bumper support. It is in place. I've already hogged mine out because we did a radiator boxing treatment to the front end of my car. So we cut out the center of it there. That's why you see that big chunk missing in the middle. Now my front air dam attached to this thing, and I'm going to be changing that out. Now that assembly and the brackets that go into the actual frame well, uh, frame, that's where the weight is. And you'll see here, oh, wrong way. Here we go. That is a comparison of both pieces next to each other. On top, you see the factory fiberglass bumper support with the center cut out of it. And then you see the mounting brackets. I scaled that and compared it to what he supplies as his bumper support. And I did get the heavy-duty one. I think they call it Dokrol, Dokrum. It's really heavy DOM wall, so it does have some rigidity to it. And I bolted it in place. Naturally, you see it takes a lot more, a lot less space. It's going to give me a lot more room for activities in the front end there. And he also offers this for new edge cars, SN95. And it even comes with, one of the versions comes with brackets for a heat exchanger. So that's pretty cool. So if you're running a, a, a supercharger, you need to put some your heat exchanger somewhere, you can get a tubular bumper support that already has mounting points for it to work with the GP500 style heat exchangers. Really, really nice. Really makes it a really easy. Let's just leave it at that. It's pretty strong. My tubby lard ass stood up on it and didn't feel any give. <laughs> You know, the, the foundation stayed underneath me. Uh, didn't really give, show any give. I used the factory bolts, and it bolted right up, tightened it up, and I laid my bumper on top of it, and it seems to be fitting really well. Now, I did weigh my fiberglass bumper with its supports, 18.3 pounds, compared to 6.6. .6. So that's right. I mean, more or less 12 pounds of savings, right under 12 pounds, right off the nose of the car. And it literally, since I already had the bumper off for some other project, which we'll talk about here in a second, uh, it saved me a bunch of weight. So now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing the rear bumper as well. I've got that one from them. That one's a little bit more of a project. you got to remove uh, the bumper cover, the bumper supports, and then you got to pull out the, it's funny, they call them bumpers or like these sleeves that go inside of the frame. Pull those out. You put his tube in there. You measure it, drill the hole, run the bolt through it, lock it into place and make sure that it sits properly on your bumper cover. That way your bumper cover doesn't give you a bunch of flex and start moving around, cracking paint, and that kind of stuff. So I'll be working on get that this weekend, hopefully, get that knocked out. I do have to bring my car into PVH because we have a prototype part related to the mass airs, the Gen 3s that we're going to be testing with Lund Racing, make sure that all works out well. And I got a new rear glass for it, so i got to get that put in there. We're full steam ahead on the autocross project. So as soon as the renderings and stuff come together, we're going to be doing that. We've got an autocross on the 26th. If you're in the area, come to PBIR. Check it out. It's on a Friday night. Uh, front bumper. My front bumper uh, looked like shit. My air dam. And it's from years of beating the hell out of it, getting on and off of trailers. And this is pretty much what it looked like. The lip of it, you can see the cracked paint. You can see the chipped edge. 
Uh, that's what my car looked like. <laughs> and this is from getting it on and off of trailers with heavy-duty ramps. If you didn't have the angle right, it would grind on the bumper. Just peel the gel coat right off. And naturally, I don't want to wrap over this. It looks terrible. And it's, well, whatever. So I decided now to wrap the car, so I had to fix this. And I reached out to my dad. I love my dad. He's taught me a lot and given me a lot of the passion I have for cars. And he's still kicking. He's still active. He's still working. And he's become, in his retirement days... A body man of sorts and this was a project I thought was perfect for him to for him and I to knock out and this is good old pops contemplating life looking at my bumper going man we've already got two Sundays into this thing we haven't gotten into primer uh, <laughs> him grinding down some of the fiberglass repair we did on the lip there to fix that gel coat area that was chipped off and then finally he put a really really good primer on it and it looks nice it looks you know it's it's good enough. I think from five feet away, it's going to look stellar. I don't think Chip Foose is going to walk by and go, shh, I wish I can get that good. But it's definitely going to help clean up the front of the car and make the wrap look at home once it's done. We've got the dent guy coming to take some dents out of the car next. And uh, this is a full-on makeover, man. This is it's a lot of work. And we're going to be racing it in between all this stuff. And we got to get ready for all these events that we want to go to, which we're going to talk to you here a little bit. We did mention the Good Guys event in Columbus. There's a chance we might be going to Des Moines, Iowa for the event the weekend before as well, making some stops in between the different shops and suppliers. The Holly Ford Fest is on the radar to go to this year as well. And so is the King of the Mountain event at UMI. We're also looking at potentially going to the F100 Super Nationals in Tennessee. And also in Tennessee is the... Super celebration for the Bronco. It's a big Bronco show. They have an East and a West Coast. We're going to try to go to that East Coast version in Tennessee, potentially. We'll see. if Once we know for sure we're going, we'll announce it. That way, uh, if you're in the area, even if you're not a Bronco guy, maybe we can set a meetup spot and everybody can come out. We can hang out at the same bar, have some beers, see some cars, have you guys bring them out. Even though, again, I'm at a Bronco event, bring whatever you got out that's got our products on it. We are going to be filming builder and vehicle and customer spotlight videos on your builds you might have seen them on our youtube channel before and i want to continue doing that it's it's a quick easy way for us to get the word out about your build and, and give back you know it's a thank you to you guys as our customers as well and give you some spotlight kind of like a feature in a magazine you know, maybe the magazines are going away these little youtube features on our our youtube channel may do the same you can share them you can download them whatever you want to do Take some high-def photos of the car, some video. I'm going to put your butt on camera, so you're going to be talking instead of me. You won't even see me in the video, and then you guys will get uh, featured on our channel. What do you think of that? So, it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be a very, very, very busy year. It's going to take a lot of patience from my family, including my wife, who's amazing, because all those weekends I'm away are away from her, and it's going to kill her. It's going to make it hard. So, but anyway... I'm missing a bunch of fun stuff going on in the chat room here. What do we got cooking? <laughs> uh, F-150, S-550 actually chimed in. Sweet, does it work on 10 or 80s? Does it need it 10 or Yeah, I would say it needs it. Now, there's some guys, and he's referencing the, uh, the thermostat on the 6 or 80s and the 10 or 80s. I like them in there. There's some guys that say that they want to keep their transmission as cool as possible because they're racing the hell out of them. They pull them out, and they want them to take as long as possible to get warm. There is some logic to that. If it's any type of a street car, you leave the thermostat in there. Street truck, anything, towing, all that stuff, you leave it in there. If you're not the guy who is building a car with thousands of plus horsepower, wheelie bars, two steps, all that stuff, going rounds, I don't really want to hear about them leaving the thermostat out. I want you to have it in there, make sure the transmission's up to temperature. If you want to kill clutches, you get them hot. You mess with the viscosity of the fluid, and you can end up with intermediate, intermediate. you can just mess up the transmission. You can lose the clutches. You can strain them. And again, if you're not racing, going rounds, that kind of stuff, I don't want you going into your truck or your car every weekend to put frictions and steels in it. It doesn't make sense. So that's what uh, I would say about that. Six or 80, 10 or 80, pretty pleased with sugar on top. Leave the thermostat in. Uh, let's see here. We're going to be getting going on our topics here, but there are some questions. We'll address them real quick. Gary Reese says, is it possible to use a Gen 2 F-150 phasers with Gen 2 Mustang cams? 
I'll have to get back to you on that, man. You have to email me on that. I don't. I don't want to answer it right now because I'm not a thousand percent. It wasn't on my radar tonight, but I'm pretty sure you matched the Mustang stuff up with the F one fifty stuff. I know Mustang for Mustang. There's some interweaving there. I think on the intake side. I think you can. If you want to know for sure, if somebody doesn't answer it in the chat room for me, email me, frank at pbhperformance.com. I'll get you an answer on that a thousand percent. Let's see here. Arthur, any chance you guys actually have a set of coyote swap headers in stock? Still waiting on BBK? No, no one has coyote swap headers in stock, man. It's crazy. Headers have been something that, whether it's COVID or not, have really been impacted by whatever's happened to business out there. The guys who make custom headers used to have some headers in stock and their lead times were short. The lead times across the board are all 8, 10 weeks now. Dakota Digital, 8, 10 weeks. It is not easy to be able to work on a build, come up, hey, I need these parts, and, and find out that you're two or three months away from getting them. That's hard, man. And it's hard for us, too, and we're trying to work through it, but... We're at the mercy of what the suppliers can give us. I have not been able to find BBK headers anywhere. I've not been able to find ARH definitely headers. You're not going to find laying around. Ultimate headers, they're making them as they go. It's pretty much across the board. So I would just say grin and bear, stay in there. The BBKs in particular, though, they're going through some changes. I think the EPA got a hold of their tail, and they're having to change their program. So their delay may be more than production. It could be legal. And it could be a while. So hopefully we have something soon. If not, I would start exploring other alternatives if you are up against a, a, a timeline or a, a finishing point that you need to get done so you can move forward. All right, let's see here. <laughs> There's still conversation about who's first in the chat. I'm going to have to make first to, first to chat PBH Live shirts. That might be cool. Oh, also, on the people who join us for the wrap sponsorship, you're going to get a commemorative hat. At least we can do. We got a viewer sponsor, only available one time ever in history hat from PBH. <laughs> yeah, F-150, S-550 kind of wins. He was the first to get to pay. <laughs> that works. Uh, Zachary Anderson, how we doing, man? Thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate your advice and knowledge today, bro. Called about Gen 3 truck motor and a Fox. Yes, I remember talking with you. We are very busy. And I'm going to touch on this real quick, hopefully real quick, and then we'll get to the topic tonight, which is why most of you are probably here. Um, we are, we've been really busy. We grew a lot in 2020, and we're working through a lot of expansion, a lot of, a lot of, volume and a lot of tech support we do a lot of tech support without selling parts people ask questions and we ask, we ask them to we, we do want it because we want to grow relationships with just about as many customers as we can but naturally as we've gotten busier it's harder to get to everyone and with the sheer volume of emails some stuff gets lost and I know it's a terrible feeling when you go, hey, man, I sent an email, and it's been like two or three days, you haven't answered me, and then you email us again, and again, it gets missed, and now you feel like we don't give a shit. We do give a shit. We do care. We care about our reputation. Our reputation is what it is because we care. So please have patience. I know it's easy to get impatient, especially with immediate gratification, but we are trying our best. We're working on trying to get systems in place so that we don't miss those emails, and it may even come down to hiring some more people to help us with that stuff remotely, which which is neat because now I don't need to have you here in the office, maybe for some training or something like that, but if a sales position were to open in the near future and you're looking for some sort of employment in this arena, it might be something we can hook up with if you're an enthusiast. Naturally, it's going to be easier for an enthusiast because you care about what you're selling and what you're doing. You want to be part of a winning team. All those things are going to work together. I'm not saying that position is available right now, but what may happen here in the future is concentrating on our YouTube channel and events and stuff like that. It's probably going to take me out of the sales force and we'll probably have to fill that gap, I would say, somehow. In part-time capacity or full-time capacity, something along those lines. But we have had some people give us some negative reviews and it's it hurts. 
I, I take it personally and I hate to see it and I want to rectify it as much stuff as possible. Usually by the time we get to that point, cat's out of the bag and there's not much you can salvage other than to say I'm sorry. So I apologize to some of those guys that have fallen through the cracks. If you have put given us a negative Google review, we respond to all of them uh, to see if we can rectify the situations. If not, hey man, you know, just give us another shot. We'll try to do it better next time. That's all we can ask to do. Just don't go on a tirade. It's so annoying. <laughs> but we, we really try to help as many people as possible. This is an example of it. Just give us a little bit of leash right now because we are slammed. So, And if we do forget your email, just email us again. We're going to catch it. We're going to get to you. Don't worry about it. You can post in our YouTube videos. You can post online, Facebook, Instagram. There's all those out. You can call us too. 561-737-2331, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. So if you're not getting through, call us, email us again. We'll get to you. I swear to you. We Very rarely does anybody get left on the hook. So anyway. F-150, S-550 chimes in and says, you cannot use F-150 phasers on GP cams on Gen 2, vice versa. Okay. That sounds pretty solid. I'll still check in on it if you want to email me and just to get it vetted 1,000%. But I would trust what this man says. He's been in the game for a while and knows what he's doing. Yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of comments on what I just talked about because I think, in general, we have a lot of people in this chat that uh, do appreciate what we do and take advantage of the service that we have, whether it's through patronage and buying parts and T-shirts and hats and stuff like that, putting stuff in the Super Chat, or just, hey, man, hey, I appreciate it. I'm here. I support you. I'll... I'll I'll be your mouthpiece to anybody who needs your stuff, but maybe I just didn't need anything from you or it was too late. But yeah, control packs are an example of that. we got a lot of guys who buy Ford Performance control packs from us because they do know that if they buy from us, they feel like 1,000% we're going to be there to help them with all the tech, especially right now because Ford Racing shut down their tech. They're doing everything by chat, and that's hard to communicate. So there's a lot of guys who buy control packs from Ford Performance through other vendors. And when they can't get help, those vendors, they're great warehouses. But they don't know what the hell they just sold you. And they can't help you with it. So they just tell you to go to Ford Performance. And then Ford Performance is sitting there going, hey, I'm working from home. And they can't help you. So we're here. We're live Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 on the phones. So you can call us. We can help you through it, work through it, and see what we can come up with. And sometimes we'll transition to email just to get photos and get an email train going so we can go back into it later on because it's hard to remember everything over the phone. But we will definitely help just anybody. I mean, anybody calling us, if you need an opinion on something, we give it to. We tried it. Like I said, if the phones are busy and you can't get through, email is an option. If email is not happening, call us. There's got to be a way to get through us. We're all here working. So, yeah. Thank you. And please be patient. Let's see. All right, so, all right, so, just to read through some of the stuff. For me and Sanchez, that's why I decided to get my control pack from you guys. Heard you guys have amazing customer service. I would agree with that. We have great customer service. I don't want to toot my own horn or make it sound like we're the best people at that in the world because there's always room for improvement, but we do, we do take pride in our customer service and working with people. Yes, sometimes you return stuff, you're going to get a restocking fee. You may have to pay shipping to get something back to us for warranty. Those are standard practices. If we oversell it and you think that we're just some amazing magic wand, co no, we still have the same practices most companies out there use. We can't change that because that's just how business works. So. But yes, please be patient. We will work with everybody. I have a guy who's trying to return a, a system that he installed six months ago, and he's out of the country, and he needs to return it. I'll take it back. If it's resellable, we'll take product back. Period. So, <laughs> yeah, YOLO does hate sales. YOLO, for the most part, hates most people, and it's merited. I mean, that I remember when I was working at Radio Shack and Wayne Acres Ford, it got to the point where, man, I don't want to. I'd hear the door open or the phone ring, I'd just roll my eyes. But eh, it's part of the, it's part of today. Interaction is huge, and being able to speak to people. There's value to it. Some people think of you as their your buddy, and we kind of work through that as best we can. We, we don't want to we don't want to push that away completely. But all right, so 
thank you guys. Thank you again for all your support. So tonight's topic, uh, we're going to touch a little bit on gauges, stock gauges on your 6R80, excuse me, stock gauges in your 3-valve to Coyote swap. Now we're working with Dover and Caleb from Foxcast Media. They are in the middle of doing this, and I'm pretty sure Caleb's going to have a video out on this build once we get everything figured out. But we had some gauges that weren't working, not necessarily the entire gauge. You know, when you look at your three valve 05, 09 car, even 2010, fuel level sender is wired independently from the CAN bus. So your fuel level will always work no matter what engine or PZM you have in the vehicle. Now, everything else is pretty much CAN bus. Now, there are different clusters within 05 to 09. I don't know, it may be in 2010 as well. There are the standard cluster, which does not have a message center. It just has two sweep gauges in the center, which I think are water temp and fuel level. Then you have the one that has the message center that has four gauges and the message center. Ideally, I would say for the least amount of problems or potential hiccups, the non-deluxe cluster is going to be the way to go. The one that has the message center, you have a higher chance of potentially having something pop up. Now, there's less of a chance of an error message flashing there if it's a Gen 1 PCM. Gen 2 and Gen 3, we haven't had a chance to test. But the CAN bus language between Gen 1, 2, and 3 is different. Gen 1 is a lot more similar to 3 valve to 2010 than the later stuff. So, working based off of Gen 1, we have more success getting the stock gauges to work. Now, to get them to work, the CAN bus has to be hooked up, your fuel level sender needs to be tied in, but there is some tuning that has to happen, and that tuning could be related to stuff as simple as what transmission you're using. So naturally, if you have a 6R80, the 6R80 computer that you just put in there knows you have a 6R80 and can calculate your speed. But if you're using like a 3650 or a TKO or a T56 and you want your speedometer to work, you're going to have to make some calibration changes in the tuning to reflect the teeth of those gears so that it's accurate. Also, when you're doing a Gen 1 Coyote swap in a 05 to 09 car, all the way to 2010, I would say. If you're going to use a manual transmission, we're going to recommend that you get a GT500 manual transmission harness. Now, the reason we do that is because the MT82 harnesses are a little bit, they're too different than the sensors that you're typically going to find in those other transmissions, your 3650, 3550, TKOs, T5s, that kind of stuff. And the sensor that was used on the 6060 is a lot more similar to them. So you use the GT500 harness. When you do that, there will be some pins that you have to change. That way everything will keep communicating. The problem Dover is running into right now with these message centers and speedometer not working. He's got these notes that I gave him today. He's going to make some changes and it should clear up a lot of it. Uh, but it's simple as changing some pins from position here, position there on the PCM connector. It's nothing major. And he should have full function of the cluster. Now one of the things that he noticed and we noticed when we did Christian's car in-house is that the overdrive light kept blinking randomly through the RPM range. Well, in some of the 11 to 14s, you had a shift light, and the CAN bus address for the shift light happens to be the address on the cluster for the overdrive light. So it just needs to be shut off in the tune. So it, a lot of the stuff gets worked through. Luckily, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt the function of stuff like tachometer. The voltage makes sense. All the message center stuff is usually auxiliary to that. Uh, Jose Delgado, thank you, brother. Every week, man, you're great. I, I love you. Thank you so much for, for supporting the show and, and being here for that. Uh, and Rubeer, we'll get to your question here in a second, brother. So there's going to be intricacies to each generation PCM being used. Right now, we still do not have our plug-and-play harness for the three-valve guys. It's something we're looking at wiring projects that we're going to be potentially reaching out and doing, but we're still vetting stuff. We're here we are now in 2021 and we're still figuring things out with customers that we've made man, you know, harnesses for. And we want to try to get all those things squared away before we get into manufacturing anything because 
it does get quite expensive and it's pretty final. And if we send something out, we don't want to have a bunch of problems with it. So bear with us right now. If you have to do a coyote swap, I'm doing it tomorrow. Control pack, control pack, control pack. And you have generation one is going to be the easiest one to get figured out. If you're going to do generation two, it's still generation two and generation three are still easy to do. They're still the same rules that apply. Just worry about the cluster, getting the cluster to work, getting shifters to work as far as 10 or 80s and stuff like that. There's options there, but there's nothing that's really super, super seamless, I would say. Not not stuff that's going to be like lights out, holy shit, got it done in 48 hours, let's roll. You can probably do that, but to the level that you probably want your car to be finished out like. So, Generation 1 right now is your best option as far as your three-valve guys going to Coyote. The compatibility is a lot better, in my opinion, plus the PCM literally fits in the bracket. Like we covered in the last show, you'll be able to reuse your cooling fan, you'll be able to reuse your radiator, K-member steering shaft, you can use headers that are off the shelf for 11 to 14 Mustang. That all holds true for Gen 1, 2, and 3, no matter which engines you go with. Generation 1, though, wiring-wise, is the closest to what you have on the vehicle already. Now, we still need to run a body harness that comes in the control pack and lay it over and make some connections at the PCM. Wiring for the cluster, wiring for the transmission harness, if it's manual, depending on what transmission is, the engine harness pretty much goes untouched. So it's a really it's it's really shaping up again to like we predicted to be probably one of the easier swaps to get done. Even if your message center is going nuts and you haven't got all that stuff figured out, you can fire it up and run it up and down the road. Uh, you should it should be fairly very, very straightforward for guys doing those swaps. And a lot less fabrication work. A lot less removing factory pieces. Now, V6 guys, yeah, you're going to have to get rid of your AC, your power steering. You have to make adaptations there for lines. You're going to have to buy more components. But still, you don't need to change your K-member. You don't need to change your steering rack. You don't need to change your radiator. You don't need to change the fan. It's very easy. You don't have to relocate the battery. You can use cold air kits that are available for 11 to 14 Mustangs, exhaust for 11 to 14 Mustangs. If you use an MT82, you can use an MT82 and put it in there. You can use the 6R80 without having to buy special cross members and, and get custom drive shafts. So there's a lot of compatibility that really rings true, and it's it's a great car, great chassis at least. We know that. So uh, we'll answer a quick question here from Root Beer. Hey, Frank, how much would it cost and what's involved to convert a Gen 3 Coyote to dry sump boiling? Dry sump oiling, uh, dry sump oiling usually entails thousands of dollars. You're talking about a custom oil pan, a tank, and some sort of belt-driven AV, AV aid style pump, and a lot of AN fittings. I would say a dry sump oiling system. If you're paying somebody to do it, I'd be expecting to spend anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars, depending on what you got, and uh, if you want to try to do it yourself. If you trust that, I would definitely hook up with somebody who has a vetted and used a vetted kit that is designed for your engine. Oiling, dry sump oiling, is not something you see a lot on Coyotes. I think the one I saw in the Holbrook video from Evan Smith was, well, that one was wet sump. I'm thinking about the Godzilla ones. Those Godzilla systems are being developed because the oil pans... And the oil pumps are a problem for fitment and what they can do and handle. So coyotes, uh, I think Chris Holbrook from the episode from Evan Smith and Revan Racing, I think they're making 850 horsepower with a wet sump oil pan. And factory oil pans are pretty damn good. GT500 oil pans are even better, which you can put on your Gen 3. Um, I wouldn't say that... I wouldn't say that even for your Mach 1 that you're potentially getting, that you need to really get into that. I'd rather spend 10 Gs putting a sequential in my car. Or a badass rear end or something along those lines, or a supercharger or something like that, than really worry about a dry sump, unless it's a race car. You know, a race car, you're racing at Daytona, and you're going to spend the rest of your life at 33 degrees of banking, why not do a dry sump? 
that's kind of where I'm at with those. But yeah, it's expensive. The Corvette guys, <laughs> Corvette guys know exactly how expensive it is because some of those later Corvettes before the C8, I think the C8 as well, had like a wet sump, dry sump system in them, but they still could go dry. So there's plenty of guys that I remember I'd be at Sebring and there'd be a Z06 with a built motor and Hoosiers. And he'd go out there and midway through Saturday, he's in the pits going, man, I think my battery's dead. The engine won't turn over. <laughs> well, it's not the battery's dead or the starter's dead. It's that your block is now in two pieces because your wet drum, wet sump, dry sump system went dry and cracked your block. So go run it through a puddle and tell your insurance company that you uh, hit a flood and get an engine. Uh, let's see here. Matt 2011 GT. Thank you for posting up, brother. Thank you for the super chat. Do you know where I can find a set of Boss 302 heads? Check in with us uh, because from time to time we do get them on some of the core engines we have. If they're in good shape, then we'll sell them if we, have a, we need to get a home for them. But yeah, definitely email me or call us. Email me directly, frank at pbhperformance.com, and I'll find out and see if we have a set back there from Mikey. He handles our engine program. I see a bunch of question marks. Let's see here. James Strother. Uh, Off-subject question, who is the go-to tuner for boosted 4.62 valve? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, it it used to be Lund. I mean, Lund could, could do stuff. They weren't maybe, let's say, the go-to top of the charts kind of stuff, but they could tune them. Ken at Palm Beach Dino knew plenty about them. I don't know if he would offer to do it now mainly because of the data stream and, and not have, being able to really log them efficiently in wide bands and stuff like that. Uh, I would probably venture to say here locally, locally, Thunder Autosports to us would be where we would send you. And because Steve has a wealth of knowledge in those cars and still offers service for them. But it's not like he has a ton of competition, I would say. Um, I don't know. I don't know who the go-to lights out 4.6 two valve boosted remote tuner might be as an option. It might be good to reach out to some of these engine builders and ask them who's having the most success with these engines. Uh, actually, maybe that guy was a Schrader. They, he's still running a 4.6. He's got a 6R80 behind it. He might have some input on it as well. So James, check those check those places. I don't know if you're local to us. If you are, Steve at Thunder Autosports is a good source. For an engine like that, it might be it might be time to go to a standalone because as they get older and uh, support dries up, you want to have a computer system that a lot of people have access to, and you can probably find more support in that arena. All right, you guys are talking about some stuff. I don't they answer any of that stuff here. Mm -mm -mm. You're, you're welcome, James. Yeah, they're 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 out there. I mean, they're old, but they're not too old. I mean, it's still a modular Ford engine. They're still being used in hot rods and street rods and high performance stuff. And honestly, they're they become really affordable because they're not coyotes. So, someone usually in that aggregate picks up the reins and starts running with it. They're just less. They're not in the forefront. If those guys didn't cross over from four point six to five zero, you're probably not going to hear too much about them right now. We got a suggestion here. DCT tuning in Toronto tunes them. They tune my old four valve and my Fox. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see who, a Triangle Speed Shop. They are, they're excellent. If they'll take it on, definitely check out Triangle Speed Shop. Uh, those guys are excellent at that stuff. And uh, like I said, Trader. I think Triangle maybe does Trader. I don't know. I forget who it is. Uh, I don't know for sure. So Yeah, and Root Beer, the GP500 oil pan has some updates in it. They're a little expensive, but has some really good updates in it. That you may want to look at versus an aftermarket oil pan. <laughs> James says he found a really good deal on a Cobra and he's a sucker for the SN95. I am too. I love those body styles. That 96, 98 Cobra, it's kind of like um, the uh, the M the Z3Ms, Ooh, those haunches. Just the proportions on the cars are really, really nice. If it wasn't for my Fox, I'd probably be in something like that. But I like them all. There's nothing really that blows me away anymore. 
I just I see cars and I see what I would kind of want out of them and how much maybe you'd want to spend on it. That's why I've never gotten rid of my coupe because there's nothing out there that's just like, man, I got to have that. And compared to this thing, just throw it away. Never. Uh, the coupe is what I've always wanted since high school and it's evolved into this thing that <laughs> I can't, it's like I can't, I can't get rid of it. It's stuck on me somehow. Uh, let's see here. Does anybody have any tech questions pertaining to their builds or products and stuff like that? Oh, I will show you something. Ha ha. Ha. I'll share this with you. We've been doing a lot more power steering components and lines and stuff like that. 96 to 98 Hydro Boost is different than 99 to 04. 99 to 04, they're all metric. Except for the return one, uh, the, uh, the nipple. It's 5 16 to 24. We have fitting kits for those. 96, 98 is completely different. Ford did some weird shit where they basically put these hard lines all over the Hydro Boost, and they had a little bracket that triangulated them, held them in place, and they gave you these female ports that your hydraulic hoses would go into. Now, these guys, I understand, are metric, but the booster itself is standard in 96 and 98. So we've been working and we are, uh, we're just waiting for the fittings to come in. We will have 96 to 98 AN fitting kits for your Hydro Boost 96, 98 in the standard sizes. And uh, we should have those here very, very soon. Very soon. So the 96, 98 Hydro Boost guys, you're not going to be tossed out into the cold. We will have you covered. We're working on diagrams as well for routing in the power steering system. We just got our low pressure power steering hose part numbers put together for the DIY stuff that is in Hydro Boost. So we got a lot going on there. Now, in studying these Hydro Boost systems, I have found all sorts of weird combinations. I went and saw a coupe in Jupiter here, my buddy Matt Heimer's building, and uh, at Horseplay Auto. If you don't know Horseplay Auto, for your Fox body restoration needs. And Jupiter. Um, so anyway, he's building a Coyote Swap car for one of his customers, Billy, and they called me up. I went up there to get some parts for my own car, and I'm looking at it, and he had a hard line coming out of a 99-04 Hydro Booster with a hydraulic hose going into it, which caught my eye because that sh this shouldn't exist on a 99-04. Started measuring some stuff, and sure enough, he has found himself <laughs> a 99-04 Hydro Boost, it was listed for 99-04 Mustang. It, it takes the block on the side, just like a 99-04 Mustang, but the port on the top is standard. And just by chance, they had one of these hard lines from a Lincoln that had Hydro Boost, and it fit right in there. And since this is metric, the 99-04 hose went into it. So look out for the part suppliers if you get a mismatch when it comes to your fittings, as far as what's known to get and going, uh, it might be that they didn't realize that this one is that one or that one is this one, and now they've left it for you to figure out. The other thing I'm finding out as we started selling these fitting kits is some of the return port nipples, the little tiny guy that's 5 24 I don't know if the camera will zoom in on that or not, but... Um, some of them are right-hand thread. Some of them are left-hand thread. If you're left-hand thread, there's no fitting out there that I can find. You're, if you want AN, you may have to cut that thing down and weld a bung onto it. If it's right-hand thread, we got you covered, no problem. But left-hand thread, I just don't see a reason why we would, if we can't find it, manufacturing that adapter. So keep that in mind. There might be some non-ABS 9904 cars that had the left-hand thread, from what I understand, but it's hard to get this stuff verified, short of just working through people that are calling you and telling you what they have and trying to put two and two and three together. So anyway. All right. So I swapped my, this is Lorenzo Enzo. I swapped my differential with a 13 GT. With a 13 GT limited slip differential, my V6 drive shaft bolted right on at the back. Concerned about the 6R80 flange. I'm not sure on the flange it, itself. So you're saying I swapped my differential 
the 13 GT for limited slip differential. Okay, and my Z V6 drive shaft bolted right on at the back. So concerned about the flame. So yeah, uh -huh. I don't know. I have to see. Can you? We should be able to change that flange. If it is different, there's always a chance you can make an adapter or find one. I would, if it doesn't bolt right up to the 6R80, I would really figure out what that bolt pattern is. And a lot of these drive shaft manufacturers make adapters. And a lot of the Ford stuff, GM stuff, and Dodge stuff cross over. You never know if they got an adapter right to sit on the shelf that make that happen for you if it is different. I haven't run into that one in particular myself to know for sure. Uh, Ryan Merrill asks, is the GT500 pan preferred over aftermarket like Moroso? I would say so. For overall fitment, OEM quality, not having issues as far as clearance to collectors and starters, I would lean towards it. It's a cast aluminum piece. It is really nice, not fabricated, so it's OEM. It has great sealing. You know, It's, it's not going to leak by any chance. And you could probably use a stock dipstick. Now, a lot of these aftermarket oil pans... They're not really designed for stock dipsticks, and the stock dipstick goes in a coyote through the valve cover, basically through the cylinder head down to the, the oil pan. And we've noticed with some of these aftermarket ones, they'll give you a bung on the kickout part of the racing oil pan, and they'll give you a dipstick, and it's supposed to thread in there, and I got two dipsticks on the car. So I, I would prefer a stock oil pan just about every situation short of full on race. And uh, there's a good case to be made for the stock oil pans. Going all the way back to Gen 1, they got windage trays and scrapers and trap doors. They got great pickups on them. They're eight quart. We used to deal with six quart going eight quart. Now we got eight quart, so we got to have 10 quart, you know? So um, for racing, I think if you have turbos and stuff like that, there's definitely probably an advantage to going an aftermarket <clears throat> oil pan, maybe for welding it and putting bungs on it for returns but you can do the same thing to a steel oil pan that's on a gen 1 or gen 2 so weigh your pros and cons i would say ryan the gt500 one like i said that's a cast aluminum piece really really nice and they put some extra work into that for the gt500 engines the five twos so let's see here andrew hanlon speaking of oil pans does the gen 2 truck motors have a windage tray system or no I believe the Mustang motors do. Ryan hit him right up. Says my Gen 2 F-150 didn't have an oil scraper from the factory. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to look that up. I'm going to start writing this shit down. I know I'm wasting time. I'm about to watch the whole video again just to get my notes. Uh, Gen 2 F-150 oil pan have windows tray, the gasket. And if it doesn't have the wind is straight. Can you just add it by switching to a Mustang oil pan gasket? That would be pretty cool to find out. Dig into it. Uh, let's see here. And Andrew, if you want, email me. Frank at pbhperformance.com. I'll see if I can dig into that and get you an answer. That way, I have a way to communicate with you. Kevin B.S. <laughs> I'm butchering that name tonight, baby. Uh, finished my 2000 GT Gen 2 manual coyote swap for performance control pack. Say that three times fast. Uh, my question is when I give my car gas, it hits 8,000 RPM. Why does it go back up to, oh, let me read this again. My question is when I give my car gas, it hits 8,000 RPM. Why does it go back up to 9,050 9, RPM? Do I need a tuner to correct that? I think you're talking about maybe idle. Or, because if you're at 8,000 RPM, that's like red red line, and you're saying it goes up to 9,050. So you're probably talking about 800 RPM, and you give it a little bit of throttle, it goes up to 9050 or 950 RPM. Clarify that for us, Kevin, before we keep talking about it. Are you talking about idle or at 8,000, holy shit, revving to the moon RPM? Uh, F-150, S-150 coming in with the tech hard. No windows tray on F-150s, only on Mustangs. Uh, Ryan Merrill says, I went with the Morosa steel oil pan because I had to weld bungs onto it for the turbo return. Yeah, exactly. Um, what? What? Oh, sorry about that, Jose. I did miss that, brother. 
Uh, let's answer Jose's question here. What's your current turnaround on building my 6R80? We're about three to five business days out on building 6R80s. So once we arrive here, we do the inspection on it. If you're sending us a core, we'll tear it down, identify if there's anything outside of what we're planning on doing to add on to the build, communicate with you three to five days, it should be out the door. I saw we had a bunch of our frictions and steels come in the other day, so we should be good to go. Sorry about that delay there, Jose. My bad. Uh, but thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate it. So let's see here. Andrew says thank you. Oh, Kevin's talking about idle. Okay, so 800 RPM, it jumps to 950. Now, the Coyotes do not have an idle air control valve. Their idle is preset with tuning. Tuning is manipulating the idle with timing, injector pulse, and throttle angle. So when you give it a little bit of gas and it comes back down, it'll hold to at a higher RPM and then slowly come to idle so that it doesn't stall. Now, some tuners can get that better than others. It's not guaranteed they will. It's also important to note that if you have a car, Coyote Swap in, in general, and there isn't a provision there for that idle to be held, and it doesn't have a speed input, especially in Gen 1, you could end up with a lot of stalling. And what happens there is from the factory, it's reading vehicle speed through the ABS system or the transmission to know when the vehicle's moving and when it's coming to a stop. That way, when you're on the highway and you just pop it into neutral, the idle doesn't, just doesn't come crashing down. It knows you're still moving. So it'll hold the idle up and float it. And as you come to a stop, it'll then drop the idle. So that's what's to be expected from a Coyote engine with its calibration, just like factory. Now, if you're saying at idle, if I give it a little bit of fire, rev it up, rah, and it comes down and holds 9,000, it's probably just letting things settle before it drops back down to 800 to keep it from stalling. Again, your tuner probably could work on that to improve it for you. I wouldn't expect it to be something um, something that they're going to chase heavily for you because it really isn't. You can hear it and you can feel the difference, but it's usually not something that's considered to be an issue per se. But it depends on your tuner and your relationship with your tuner, especially if they have the car with them there, that they'll probably be able to work on a little bit more for you. Yeah, Andrew uh, Hanlon's asking F-150, S-550, if you did the Mustang oil pan uh, with the upgraded uh, window tray gasket. They aren't that expensive. They're not killer. When it comes to Ford parts, um, while the stuff is still available from original production runs, it's affordable. The older it gets, the more expensive it gets. If Ford has to reorder these parts, they're reordering them at lower quantities, the price goes up. The more they have to warehouse them, and move them around the country, the higher the price goes. The more they have to warranty them out, the higher the price goes. Everything ends up coming out of the parts department's ass, basically. So keep that in mind as these parts get older, they either drop off and go discontinued or they get really expensive because they're not ordering them in massive quantities anymore for production reasons. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see if you can put the, uh, the gasket the Mustang gasket on an F-150 pan. Let me write that down. It'd be an interesting thing to find out for sure. Right off the top, I don't think it'd be a problem to do, but uh, I don't think it'd be a terrible thing to try to get figured out, but there might be something that's in the way. I don't see what it would be, but it would be really, really neat to see it. If you can just take your F-150 pan down, put a Mustang gasket in, and add a window tray. And it won't leak. I mean, I, I had a Canton on my old Windsor with a windage tray. And, man, I thought it was hot, hot shit. I had crank scraper. The trap doors squeaked. And the the windage tray, awesome. Try to get that shit to seal. It was at least a, one complete tube of Ford gray silicone, TA31, to get it done. And it still seeped. Now, I may have done a shitty job of doing it, but there was no, like, areas that weren't sealed, and it would just vibrate and move around. Most likely, that's what killed it and so forth. But I will give you this. 
that Canton windage tray, it caught an entire bottom end when I blew that motor up. It ate three rods and pistons, and it kept that motor from windowing the block, that rotating assembly when it came apart, which is really interesting. I'll have to see if I can find those pictures. It was impressive. It looks like somebody literally opened the oil pan, threw a grenade in there, and then closed it and walked away because it was just bellowed out. The window straight screen was all pushed out, had cracks on both sides of the block, but it didn't cut all the way through the oil pan. If it would have done that, I, I mean, that car probably would have burned to the ground. So uh, The four factory ones in the Coyotes probably aren't going to do that because they're plastic, I believe. So. Okay, it looks like, okay, yeah, F-150, S-550, hitting hard. He's the MVP tonight. Uh, he says, it's a pain to install the windage tray. Got to remove the oil pickup tube. So you're trying to do it in the car. Yeah, it's probably gonna, it's probably going to be a problem, especially if you have a, you're doing a Fox Mustang. You probably have to drop the oil, pan, or excuse me, the K-member. The only K-member I know of that you can remove without having to hoist the engine, Maximum Motorsports for S-197s has a K-member. It strengthens the front of the car. But the motor mounts in the S197, they, they go to this bulkhead that goes to the frame, and then the K-member bolts to the bottom of that. So on that K-member, if you put it in your S197, you can drop the K-member without removing all the suspension, and you don't have to worry about hoisting the motor up. So you need to get access to stuff. It's literally like six bolts away, and you're done. And it improves the rigidity of the car. It makes it heavier. It's definitely a hot-ass piece. But... Uh, they, they designed that originally. Um, they designed that originally with the intention of making a SLA for the front end of the S197s, which I wish they would do because if they did, that would really knock that out of the park. But absolutely. Yeah, F 150, S550, definitely the tech MVP of tonight. He gets one gold star from us. <laughs> um, let's see here we'll take a few last questions here before we sign off for the night R stage 3 welcome to the show man caliber transmission suggested a LPX HD which is the one from Lethal Performance twin disc for my soon to be bolt on 2.3 gen 1 obviously I trust their judgment have you guys have you guys given it a try know anybody who has I know it's still new well, I believe the the lethal the lethal clutches are made by McLeod. I, I, that's my takeaway, which is an excellent manufacturer. Dual disc clutches make a lot of sense on these coyote, supercharged coyotes. Pedal effort it's as, it's exquisite. It's close to stock and it has the holding power of a semi. Okay, so I would not be afraid to use a lethal performance clutch. I know Jared and those guys. If you had a problem, they'd stand behind it. It's something new they're launching the, to the uh, to the aftermarket, but I believe they probably partnered with McLeod. So what you're seeing there is probably something along the lines of the RXT and the RST clutches that McLeod offers. So that's that would be my takeaway of that right now. I have not had a chance to use one yet. No. My clutches, I mean, in my car, I, I can use single disc uh, stuff, so it's. Center Forge Ram, Xetti, that kind of stuff. But when we were doing more NT82s and GT500s, dual disc clutches for sure. We just did a dual disc clutch in that yellow New Edge GT that we supercharged with the Edelbrock blower. Shifts perfectly with a T56. Lights out. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, Andrew, you had a Canton set up in your push rod. Uh, yeah, that was the way to go, man. For a Windsor, you need everything. You need long tubes, shorties. You need a, <laughs> the performance mods were endless for my Windsor when I had it together, man. It was uh, I was constantly doing shit to it, and nothing would make it faster or more reliable. <laughs> The only thing that fixed that was a coyote and some experience. Uh, <laughs> yes, F-150, S-550. Yes. Thank you very much for being a supporter, brother. Thank you for being here. Yeah, 
Yeah, he's, uh, if you guys want to catch F-150, S-550 on IG, he's, uh, he's saying he's available. Hit him up. Hit, you know, honestly, this is a small community that you guys can help each other, and I'm here to back it up as much as possible when we're available. I'm on social media as well, but my social media, I mean, I probably have a hundred message requests that I just, they're so old and they get, please put it into our emails because it, it's the only way I can keep them organized. And when I get out of here, get home, it's hard to just hop on the phone again and start answering questions. So you got to have a little bit of a separation here and there. All right, Jose, give me a, give me a ring or give us a ring. Uh, 561-737-2331. We'll be here to help you anytime, brother. <laughs> no. A oh, real teal. I watched that video today, Alex's video on that. That thing's nasty. I like that car. I don't know who wouldn't like that car. Hey, it's a Cobra teal. What's it got? 13 to 1 compression stick. Laying it down. I mean, I know Leroy is fast. Uh, I've seen it run. What I think Did he go 7s in that? Or was it low 8s? So whatever happened, happened, but he got beat. So, and Realty will uh, had some help from some from some friends in the pits there, which love seeing, and they documented the whole thing. So it was really cool. Everything was straightforward. They hauled ass. Car ran well. They figured out a problem. They got it fixed. That's what it's all about, man. Talk about feeling good at the end of that night and having a beer and feeling accomplished, man. That's enough to bring you to tears if you're involved in that kind of stuff. So that was really really cool. And it was great to see a Ford spank a GM. <clears throat> oh, uh, Eric Copeland asked a question that I will address here real quick. Any word on the Gen 3 truck control pack yet? They're coming up cheap. Then I'm bored with my Gen 1, LOL. <laughs> yeah, get that compression, get that power, get that DI. We are very close to launching it. We are literally taking orders for it and... It's just vetting the calibration and knowing 100% that it works before we release it into the wild. But I believe it's just going to be a calibration change in the computer. And if that's the case, Gen 3 truck motors are back in business big time because they are affordable. They do pack a punch. And you don't have to buy a bunch of weird shit and change cams and all that stuff to get them running. That's going to be a winner right there. I, my, 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 me, myself, I'm looking for a, a 13 to, it was a 12 to 1 compression short block in the cores back there so I can put my boss heads on it and take my Gen 1 motor out and put that in as a long block and pick up some ponies from it. So I think it'll be definitely something that's going to be pretty hot. And I'm glad that we have that already figured out so that when they do get out there, we'll have the solution for everybody and they can just go ahead and order their control packs and then Ford Racing can figure out how quick they can get them to us. Because that's the other problem. We have Gen 2 6R80 uh, control packs. I mean, we are 20 plus deep ordered from Ford Performance, and they're just not showing up. So, oof. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and sign off for the night. We've been on for a little bit over an hour. It's been fun as usual. Thank you guys so much for your support. We'll be back next Wednesday night. I'm going to try to dig up some more tech go over some questions that get answered please comment on the video even if you don't have a tech question just say thanks hey i enjoyed the show it really helps the algorithm as far as shooting this thing out into youtube share the videos like the videos subscribe and hit the notification bell as well i'm gonna get out of here because i'm tired and i gotta be back here at eight o'clock in the morning to do it all over again <laughs> we got a busy weekend too i gotta get that rear bumper on from math racing uh, what else do I got to do? I got to put my new wheel spacers on the front that I got from CJ Pony. I got to do some other small fab work on the car. And it's Valentine's Day weekend. Guys, it's Valentine's Day this weekend. Girlfriends, wives, mistresses, make sure you get something for them. Do not let that lapse. If you listen to me at anything, remember, you take care of home. <laughs> So get your girlfriends, wives, mistresses, uh, buddies, a little something for Valentine's Day. Make them feel special. Because they are. All right, guys. 
Have a great night. Thank you so much for being here. PBH Live wouldn't be anything without you. We'll see you here next week, Wednesday, 7 o'clock Eastern, here at PBH headquarters in beautiful downtown West Palm Beach, Florida. You guys have a great night.